thank you for that lovely introduction, Bob. Um, so, and thanks to everybody for joining. I'm really, uh, I really wanted to do this topic as we move into the holidays, um, because we may be getting a chance to see family, or maybe we won't be, and we'll be seeing people virtually, and either way, um, it's a good opportunity to do some oral histories. And so, um, and oral histories, I think, are, are such an important um, part of history, um, because it's not the big history you read about in, in the books in, and everything with politics and laws and all those kind of things, because it really helps you capture the bits and pieces of everyday life. Um, and that really adds richness that aren't always captured. And by telling those stories and listening to those stories, um, we get to learn about the attitudes and the beliefs and the, um, the knowledge, I'm having to acknowledge that, um, the knowledge, the perceptions, the traditions, the, the, the biases, prejudices, superstitions that people have, and really getting to hear that firsthand. And when you're doing it with family or, you know, it helps us to connect, to empathize and to understand the past um, through other people's eyes. And I really like the fact that, that stories stick with us more than just lists and facts and things like that. We can remember stories, we're storytelling animals and they stay with us, they give us strength, they give us courage, they give us lessons, they give us a sense of community. Um, and especially in trying times, they can help us feel less lonely and discouraged and to be inspired and be brave. So, and the other thing I like about oral histories, I think is especially cool, is that they help both people just as much. So when you're doing an oral history, you gain because you're learning these histories and, and you're, you're gaining knowledge. But the person that is being interviewed is also really helped by doing the oral history. They've, they've done studies and they've shown that it helps people's memories. It helps, um, it improves their moods. It helps them, um, you know, reminiscing is an important thing, especially as you, um, as you get older and maybe, you know, loneliness is pervasive in this country. So having, taking the time and having somebody really listen to their stories is really um, a valuable thing and it's beneficial on both sides. So your goal when you're doing oral histories is to get people to tell you as, um, stories as much as possible about the topic that you're interested in, not so much just dry facts. So before you do an oral history, there's some preparation that needs to be done. There's just a few things. You need to decide how you're going to record them. Are you going to do, you know, actual electronic recording or are you going to take notes the way they, that they used to? And if you're going to record, are you going to do it through audio or um, video? And um, there's pros and cons on both sides. And, if, and there's also tools you can use. If anybody has questions at the end, we can talk a little bit about the technology. The other thing to do is to be sure to set time parameters. Um, doing an oral history is tiring. It's tiring for both people. Um, so you wanna be sure to set a time parameter ahead of time because you don't wanna talk until you're both exhausted. Um, and so it's better to stop, um, to stop earlier and maybe do a couple oral history interviews that are shorter than it is to try to do one um, long one because oral history interviews really are different than a conversation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Before you do it, you also wanna do some research. Even a small amount of research, even if it's you're interviewing your mother and you think you know everything about your mother, it's important to kind of try to write that down before you. So you can do maybe a, um, a little family tree. And you may think you know everything, but when you actually start trying to write it down and you write down your mom and you write down when she was born and then you start adding siblings and figuring out when she was married and when her parents, her parents' names and where they, you know, when they were married, all of a sudden you start realizing that there are some gaps. And, um, and that's good because once you have those gaps, you start to feel curious and you start to, it starts to bug you a little bit, kind of like when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and there's a missing piece. And then when you find that piece and you put it in there, you get this sense of accomplishment. If you have those little gaps, that little bit of curiosity before you go talk to your subject, um, then you'll feel that same jolt of um, happiness <laughs> when you get that question answered. So if you do that prep ahead of time, it kind of focuses your curiosity. So you look at some facts about their lives, look at maybe the places where they live, that might prompt some questions. Um, and then look at a timeline of when they lived so that you know kind of what what periods in time you want to talk about. Obviously, there's 
there's family events. If you're talking to family, you want to talk about when they were married, when they had children, those kind of things. But you may also want to put it in historical context. For example, if you were interviewing somebody from Southport and they were alive in 1954, you're going to want to ask about Hurricane Hazel. It's just one of those things you're going to ask about. What, what happened with that? Um, you know, you may want to ask about if they were around during World War II, about the USO, um, about you know, what happened in World War II, what they remember about that. Um, and, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you might ask about, you know, women's libs, civil rights. So it can be local events, it can be national events, it can be world events, but just maybe some context. Um, we may, I'm not going to give you um, rote questions. Sometimes you might see um, books that say, you know, 500 questions to ask grandma or a thousand questions to ask grandpa and you get these books of questions. And I personally don't find those very helpful. Um, I think it's kind of mind numbing to look at all those questions. I think it's much better to come up with organic questions based on your own research as you go through it and what you get curious about. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna tell you a few ways, that's the preparation. I wanna tell you a few ways that doing an oral history is different than a regular conversation. And this plays into why it's tiring um, when I mentioned that it, it can be tiring. Because it's artificial, okay? It's not the same as a conversation. It's not a dialogue. It's not them talking, you talking, interrupting, you know, one thing leading to another. It's very, it requires a lot of self-control on the part of the person that's doing the interview because you need to be quiet. <laughs> Maybe that's not hard for you. It's hard for me. So when I'm doing it, you want to you wanna try to, you know, not interject. If they tell, a lot of times in the conversation, somebody tells a story, you know, maybe they tell you about a dog they had when they were a child and you go, oh, I had a dog when I was a child. And all of a sudden you're trading stories. That's not what this is. They, you, they tell their stories. You save yours for later. Um, but you do, and then um, you do want to ask, follow-up questions, right? You don't want to interrupt them, but you want to ask follow-up questions. So if they tell you about that, you know, they say, I had a dog when I was a child, you know, maybe that leads you to, well, um, you know, what did your family think of you having a dog? What did, did your mom think? What did your dad think? And kind of those kind of follow-up questions that help this conversation get a little deeper. Um, when they're talking, you might think of some questions that you you know, some other question that you want to ask them, it's best to have something to write with so you can just make a note to yourself that you want to ask that question later so that you can let them finish their question. One thing, okay, this is an, a, another example of where it's do what I say, not as I do. Because <laughs> one thing that's hard for me is um, when people are talking, I tend to make encouraging noises, you know? So they're talking and I'll go, uh-huh, oh, ooh. And, and I want them to know I'm, I'm interested and I want them to talk more. Um, on a recording, that is very annoying. <laughs> and you want this recording of them talking and maybe you want to put it with some pictures on a video or you want to do something and you hear somebody interjecting, ah, ooh, that's not so good. So when, try not to do it. Again, it's, for some people like me, it's hard not to, but um, it's, it's a good thing to try to avoid. But on the other hand, you do want to encourage them to talk. So you need to be very careful about what your facial expressions are, right? You don't wanna just be sitting there with this blank poker face um, because they'll, they'll start to think, oh, they're not interested and they'll shut down. Even if you're just concentrating on not talking, um, that'll come across as you're bored. So you do want to make sure that your face is, you, is expressive, that you look interested, that when they're telling a funny story, that you're smiling, if they're telling something concerning, that it shows on your face. That helps them feel connected um, and talk more. It can be very difficult to talk about yourself and to tell these stories. People are often uncomfortable. They're afraid they're boring you. And any indication that they are, they will start to shut down. But if they get the feeling that you're really into this, they will give you more and more. Um, okay, so that's how it's different, but that's exhausting. So that's a, a reason why, you know, it's better to do three 30-minute interviews than to try to do one 90-minute ones for them and for you. Okay, now I'm going to tell, uh, tell you about 10 or 12 um, tips and techniques. 
for doing them. Um, one we touched on a little bit, that you want to reassure them that what they have to say is valuable and interesting and important. And you want to, with your words and then also with your, your body language and your facial expressions. Again, people are, are afraid that what they have to say is, is not interesting. They think they have to have, you know, cured cancer, gone to the moon, been the president in order to have something interesting to say. So the more that you can reassure them, that this is interesting and that you do find value in what they have. And if you need to label it and say, well, it's, you know, this is social history. This is what we're doing here. Or you can just say, I really like these stories. Please tell me I want to know them. However it works, just make sure that they, they realize it's okay. You're, you're not looking for, you know, the cure for cancer. Um, so some people are hesitant to talk. Other people maybe are a little too eager to talk. <laughs> and sometimes, um, you come across somebody who has a story, like they're known for this story. They love to tell this story. And maybe you don't want that story. You want like the real stuff. You know, you don't want their shtick. You've heard it a million times. Instead of trying to um, suppress that story and say, let's talk about something else, encourage it. You get them to tell it up front act like you've never heard it before, laugh at the funny parts, be surprised at the surprising parts, appreciate it as much as possible so that they feel good about that story. And then you can move on, okay? Then they'll know that you heard them and then you can kind of maybe move on it to the other stuff. But if they wanna tell it, just don't, don't, don't struggle with it, just embrace it. Um, in the same way, because that helps build trust, right? If they know you've listened to their good story, they might be willing to tell you some, because a lot of times people use that in order to shield themselves, right? They don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to tell you the vulnerable stuff. So they tell you the, the shtick. Um, it's better to, um, so that's a way of building trust. Another way to build trust is to start with easier questions. So even though you want stories, you don't want to start with, so tell me a story. You probably want to start with simple facts. So let me just get it down, get it straight. Your full name is, you were born such and such, you were the third child out of eight, you know, just kind of getting all that fact stuff that's easy to answer. It gets them into the mood of answering things. It gets them calmed down. They're not so nervous. And it also, if you're recording, it helps them to be a little uh, more comfortable with being recorded. And then they start realizing, oh, okay, I can do this. I can answer these things. Then you're going to transition into more open-ended questions. And some good open-ended questions start with um, how and where um, and what. What did you do? How did you do it? Where were you when you did it? Those are all good neutral questions. When is a question that goes either way and you have to kind of gauge it on the person. Some people are totally comfortable with when. Some people, um, they get nervous. They don't exactly remember. They want you to, you know, was it 1973 or 1975? And then it's, it's like a quiz or a test. Um, if, you, if it's really important to you to know kind of when it was, you can ask them some context questions. So you might wanna ask them, well, how, uh, just about how old was Uncle Steve at that time? A lot of times people remember that, like, oh, he was eight. They remember that, but they might not be able to say the year. Um, so those kind of things, or do you remember what grade you were in, or do you remember what house you were living in, or things like that. That's context. Sometimes, what car did you have? You know, if it was a, if it's a guy, sometimes they remember that way. Um, but questions like that that are easier to remember for some reason, um, dates tend to make people nervous. Um, I think because they think it's like school or something. Um, so what you want to do is, as much as possible, start to connect to emotions. So um, the way to do that, instead of saying, um, well, you know, did you like being a mom? You know, they're going to say, well, yes, every moment was blessed. Um, you could say something that's more connected to an emotion, like what surprised you the most when you became a parent? You know, what? and they can go either way. I, I was surprised I liked it, or I was surprised that, you know, it was so much work. Um, so what surprised you? Um, what were you worried about? That's another one, especially if they were going through something traumatic, maybe they were, um, you know, at home during a war or, you know, those kind of things. You could say, what, what was, what worried you most back then? People tend to remember things based on emotions more than just 
facts. So that will that helps resonate. One of my own personal things is I don't really care for superlatives. So I don't like to ask somebody, um, what was your best day? What was your worst moment? Because it makes them have to make a decision, right? And that, again, that puts stress on you. Uh, what if I picked the wrong day? What if I picked the wrong moment, you know? So if you kind of can um, make, take the pressure off and say, you know, what was, what was one of the worst things that happened to you? What was one of the best things? But by putting one of or some of in front of it, then they're not having to pick the best or the worst. And if they think of something later, they don't feel like they're contradicting themselves. So if they say, oh, one of my best days was such and such. And then as you're talking, they may remember another best thing. And they're not having to contradict what they said before, like, oh, another one. And they don't, they don't feel foolish. So, um, so it's good. And you can ask us, or like, what, what one of the things you're most proud of? That's another um, uh, good one. But again, one of. Um, another way to ask a question is to ask uh, what somebody else thought of it. So if they tell you about something that they did, sometimes people will tell me, uh, things that they did when they were kids that are just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't believe he did that. Um, so sometimes it's good to ask, gee, what did your mom think? You know, what was your mom's reaction? What was your dad's reaction? Um, as opposed, you know, instead of you doing it. And that'll give you, they'll give you more stories and more dynamics, um, you know, more information about the family dynamics. Um, small details, go ahead and ask small details. People they're in their comfort zone. You know, if they said, um, they went, to, they said every morning I went to school, you know, and if you started saying, well, how did you, how did you get to school? You know, and then they start telling you that they, they walked and that they had to take their younger brother along because he would always get lost or, you know, all of a sudden stories start coming out. Um, that you wouldn't have just if you focused on the facts. So any of those kind of details, and again, people are in their comfort zone with small details. Um, that leads, leads to stories. Um, asking them to describe people, you know, what did, you know, what did your little brother look like when he was little? What did, you know, what did your, what were your mom and dad like? Um, again, it's a way in to the stories. Um, so stories are, our memories are stored with sensory um, things and they're stored with, um, so they're stored with emotions and they're also stored with um, our senses. So any aids that you can give that would help um, promote memories. So um, sharing photos, you know, looking at photos, visually remembering things. Um, if you can take a, a, a walk to a um, uh, uh, the house where they grew up or the neighborhood that they grew up, that's going to bring back memories. Um, uh, a scrapbook, maps, anything that kind of conjures up some memories. Um, music, a lot of memories are stored around music. So if you can play some songs that, you know, might bring back some memories. Um, food, you know, we, we store memories with that, things that they had as children. Um, smells, you know, senses that way, anything you can, um, might bring back memories. Um, old clothes, you know, looking to an attic together, sometimes old clothes, old scrapbook, things like that, all bring back memories, anything tactile that you can hold, um, even the way like fabric would feel or things would feel, any of the way you can engage any of the senses. Another great method is to, um, to do a task together. So this, when I mentioned doing the family tree, you might start it, but then collaborate on it. Go, you know, this is how far I got with the family tree. Can you help me fill it in? Um, again, that gives them a task. It starts things moving and they start remembering, oh, you know, well, so-and-so or, you know, this person over there. And, you know, and so that, that helps them remember. Um, another fun one is sketching the floor plan of their the house they grew up in. And that's a lot of fun. I, I recommend doing it even yourself. It's very pleasurable to like start drawing it, you know, what you, where you lived when you were a kid. Um, and it brings back a lot of memories. And if not the whole house, then also um, the bedroom, that your childhood bedroom, um, you know, who else slept in it, how the, where the bed was, where the window was, where your toys were, all that kind of stuff. It starts bringing back um, memories. 
Um, in the same way, a map of the neighborhood can really help promote stories. So if you say, here's your house, now where was your best friend's house? Um, where was school? You know, kind of, how did you get there again? Where's the school? Um, where's the church? Where was the, the um, grocery store? Were you able to go to the grocery store on your own? Could you cross the street? How old were you when you were allowed to cross the street? Was there a scary house in the neighborhood? All that kind of stuff, it starts bringing that um, back. Another um, another great one, this works, most of these will work even if you're not there. You can do these virtually. One that um, really probably works best if you're both there is to cook a family recipe together. Um, that's a great one for, you know, it's very sensory, so it brings back those kind of emotions. Plus, it's just somehow collaborating and doing that together, and you're going to be chatting while you're doing it. Um, so that's a, a good one to do. Um, and then in the same way, doing a, a craft together, and this doesn't necessarily have to be you both doing it, but say you both like to crochet or knit or embroider or uh, paint or do woodworking. If you're both working on that and you're just kind of sitting there talking and you can have a recording device, but somehow having doing something with your hands kind of um, frees up your mind and helps you to, to think. Um, Ruth Ann knows, right? <laughs> She's sitting there. <laughs> it can be very, it can be very good and very um, bring back memories and help you to talk. All right, so those are those are pretty much all my um, my tips. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Um, so when I talk to people about or history, there's usually three concerns that they bring up. So I'm going to talk about those now. Um, one of them is, um, what if you have want to talk about something and it's like a difficult topic? How do you bring up questions that are difficult? Um, and one, one sort of rule of thumb is you can ask just about anything if you can do it from a place of curiosity. So if you can manage to ask it in a way that is respectful and, and curious and neutral, people will pretty much respond to that. Um, that's not easy to do, and it's especially not easy to do with family. But if you can do that, you'll find people do respond. People, the big thing is people don't want to be judged. They don't want to be judged for their life, their actions, their behavior. And if they sense at all that you're being judgmental, they're going to shut down. Um, so one thing that I would avoid, remember I said you can ask what and how um, and where, maybe when. I avoid why, because it's really hard to ask why someone did something without sounding like you're judging them. You know, it's just really hard. Um, if you can do it, that's great, but it is really hard to say, um, why did you do that? <laughs> um, another way around that, though, is you can ask them, if they tell you something, you can say, um, um, well, what were you, what were you hoping would happen? You know, when you did that, what, what were you, what were you hoping the outcome was going to be? And then, then they can tell you sort of in a positive way, you know? Um, so, um, and if, you know, even if it didn't turn out that way, it gives them the benefit of the doubt that they had good intentions and it kind of puts them more in a, in a positive light. Um, and they can maybe somehow tell you their disappointment. I'd hoped it was going to be really successful, you know, but then it wasn't. And then they can, but it, it sort of makes you on an even level. Um, another thing is, this is a time when it's okay to frame questions negatively. You might get a, more of a response. So um, maybe instead of saying, um, Oh, um, Grandpa was always such a great guy. Wasn't he wonderful? There's pretty much nowhere they can go with that other than to say, yeah, he was great. That's fine. <laughs> but if you're trying to get maybe a little behind, you know, you might say, um, you know, I, Grandpa was great, but I kind of always, just, you know, got the feeling that maybe as a dad, he would have been pretty strict, you know, something. Then they can either 
go with that and say, yeah, he was really strict. He was a lot different as a grandpa. Here's how he was as a dad. They can go with that. Or they can say, no, he was always a, you know, a pushover. It was mom who was the real disciplinarian, you know, but you can, you can kind of make it that way. If you say something that's a little bit, if you say the negative, then that gives them the chance to either correct you or that you've made it a safe space for them to agree with you. So um, that's just kind of a way to, to bring it up. Okay, so that was the first one that people don't like to be judged, but you can still manage to get the questions through. Um, the, the another question that I get is um, what happens if they lie? Or if they're just saying something that you know is wrong? So if you're talking to somebody and you know, maybe you were there, you know, or you have the facts, you know what the story is, um, and they're saying something that's not true. So one thing to remember is um, this is not a deposition. So it's not, it, it's not going to go to some court of law. You don't have to make sure that they tell it to you accurately. It's also not a debate. It's not the time if they say, you know, so-and-so for you to go, no, that's not the way it was. It's okay, you know. You can you can say, um, "Oh, I always heard, or I heard somewhere that it was such and such." You can kind of broach it that way and see if they will correct themselves, you know, or they might just shut it down and say, "No, it was like this." It's okay. This is not going to go to a court of law. And sometimes it's really interesting. So my my philosophy on this is that sometimes this is going to be. I think this is a little controversial. Truth is more important than accuracy. So what we're looking for here is their truth because this is their oral history. This is their worldview. This is their perspective on things. It's not the final end saying. And sometimes they're inaccurate. Sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's just unintentional, but either way, you don't need to correct it. Now, what you can do is, um, try to find out enough information so that you can verify later that it's accurate. So I'm gonna give you two examples because this is kind of confusing. So the first is about my, my own grandmother. So my grandmother until the day she died insisted that her mother died when she was five years old. That hands down, she would not change her story. Even to the point where my mother, they were at the cemetery one time and my mother said, look, you can see the date that your mother died. You were six. I don't know why this stuck in my mom's, <laughs> it would bug my mom that, that she didn't have it right. And she would say, no, I was five. And she said, but look at the date. Didn't matter. I was five. So um, after a, a long period of time when my mom <laughs> chewed on this, she finally realized, you know, there were about um, 10 kids in the family at that point. My great grandmother was sickly. And then the flu pandemic came and she had passed away. It's quite possible that no one ever told my grandmother when her birthday was there. Nobody noticed her birthday. She was five, she turned six, but nobody, nobody noticed. There was no one to do that. And then at some point her mother died and then she was sent to live with relatives and they probably said to her, well, you're six. You know, maybe you're gonna go to school now because you're six, whatever. They told her and in her mind, that's when she, she turned six. So. Is it accurate? No. <laughs> but does it tell us a lot more about what was going on in her life? Yes. So it's kind of, you know, you seeing why, why was that important to her? And it's verifiable, right? That's an easy one to verify. We've got birth certificates, death certificates. It's verifiable. There's another story. Um, Bob and I were fortunate enough to interview um, Myrtle Brown Watson earlier this year before she passed away. And um, she was 103 at the time, and she was telling us stories about World War II. And um, she had a lot of good stories. One of her stories was that there was a German spy in Southport during World War II. And um, she didn't remember any details. She remembered a few details. She remembered that the woman was not very nice, <laughs> that she had been to her house and she was a little snooty to her. Um, she thought it was a couple. Um, and that she'd had a conversation with her father about it. Her father was a minister in town and she'd said, if he's a spy, why don't we, why aren't you doing something? And he said, well, we have bigger fish to fry. Okay, that was the sum total of her story. 
And Bob and I tried to find, you know, we tried to ask some questions so that we knew we could go away later maybe and determine who this was or what it was or who she was talking about. Um, but we weren't able to, to get any. And it doesn't matter. Was there a spy in Southport in World War II? I don't know. Could have been, probably wasn't, but there could have been. But what's more important, I think, is the idea that obviously there were people at the time that were worried about their neighbors being spies. There were people, there was that, it was close-knit community, but still there was some concern about, um, can I trust this person? Maybe that person has a, a, an accent. Maybe this person moved here recently. Maybe this person keeps to themselves. Maybe this person takes walks on the beach. Whatever it is, there was some kind of suspicious behavior that people then thought. And so that tells us a lot about the community. Nobody did anything about it. So that also tells us about this community. You know, they didn't like throw the person in jail. But there was that underlying sense of unease, which would be expected from a town living on the edge of the, um, of the Atlantic Ocean, where U-boats are off, off water. People did worry about Germans coming ashore. So it tells us a lot. There's no way to ever verify it. There's no way to know whether it was true or not true, but it is intriguing that people gossiped about it, right? Okay. Um, then the other thing that people ask about um, has to do with, um, well, it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's lumped under unpleasantness. <laughs> um, one part of it is what if people start telling stories that we would consider consider inappropriate or using language that we would consider inappropriate. Um, again, my feeling is we're not here to judge. That's their worldview. That's their perspective. That's what was appropriate at the time. There might be a story that they thought was funny, you know, some childhood story that they thought was funny that we would think was bullying, you know, or, you know, just that kind of thing where values have changed. My feeling is I would let them tell it. Um, it's meaningful to them. Um, I would maybe reassure myself that if I, if we are finding it appalling, that's good. That means society has grown over the last 50, 60 years from when that story took place, that we've now all changed the way we look at the world and that's okay. But I wouldn't censor them and shut them down, um, would be the way that I would handle it. Um, you, maybe you won't want to share that story widely, but I would let them keep talking because then they'll trust you more. Um, and then the other thing is that sometimes people will get emotional, right? They're telling you a story. It's stirring up memories. Not all memories are happy. So they may suddenly be upset or crying or uh, embarrassed or sad or whatever. So then what do you do? And um, one thing is you don't panic. <laughs> And then also you remind yourself, you don't, you don't have to fix this for them, you know, and you don't, um, there's a, there's a, a tendency to rush in and say platitudes and say, oh, well, you know, it's all fine now. It all worked out fine. Well, that's going to make them feel shut down. They've just told you something really significant in their lives. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't suggest doing that. I also wouldn't suggest just saying, well, let's move on to something else. Obviously that's upsetting you again, those kind of shut it down. So what I would do is sort of acknowledge what they've just told you, you know, and say, wow, that, that must have been really, really hard. I, I can't even imagine what that was like. And just kind of, and you know, and thank you for telling me. Let them feel it, that you've heard them, you know it. And then kind of transition them away from the emotion. So they're in this flood of emotion. If you can kind of transition them into more of a logical, analytical way of thinking, so by asking them some question like, um, you know, looking back at it now, you know, what, um, what, do you, what do you wish you had known when you were at that stage? What would have helped you? You know, or um, how do you think that that influenced, you know, other decisions that you made? Just, it doesn't really matter what the question is as long as it's kind of analytical because it moves them out of the emotional part of their brain over into the, the analytical logical part of the brain and it helps them get away from the emotions without feeling like you're just dismissing them. So um, that's one approach. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that um, sometimes um, people don't wanna talk about stories because they are 
especially in a family situation, they may have something that you want to know about, but they don't feel comfortable talking to you because they, they don't want to see the emotion on your face. They don't want to see you be upset. They don't want to see you concerned. And um, so this came up recently. I was talking to someone who um, in next March, we're going to be doing a, um, a, a memorial for the 80th anniversary of the sinking of the John D. Gill, uh, which was a tanker that was sunk by a U-boat right off the shores of um, Southport. And the survivors came in here to Southport. And so we're going to do this. I hope you all come in Mar March 12th. So I was talking to the daughter of one of the survivors. And back in the 90s, the Southport Historical Society had erected a memorial um, for those survivors, for the, for the, for the people and, and the people who didn't survive, for, the, for the, the John D. Gill. It's down on the waterfront. And they found some survivors to come to, for, for the ceremony. So um, I was talking to the daughter of one of the survivors and I said, um, you know, I have the stories that are in the newspaper because they interviewed him at your, your dad at the time. But are there any other family stories, you know, any other stories that he told the family that we could add to this? And she said, no. She said, I, dad never talked about it to us. She said, I never heard the story until he came to Southport and he did that interview. And then I read it in the newspaper. And so, because obviously he didn't want to tell his daughter about the night he almost died, um, but he was okay telling a strength, you know, it, like it's neutral, a neutral person he could share that with. So I just say that because if there is something really intensely personal in your family that you really wanna know, your family member might be willing to tell somebody else and have it recorded because they just don't have to see your face while they're telling you. Um, and the same way, if you are interested in doing oral history, you'd be doing, for, for other people, you would be doing a service, a favor for the Southport Historical Society if you spoke to people because maybe there's stories that they would tell to you um, as a neutral person that they would not feel comfortable telling directly to their family. Um, okay, any questions about any of that? Any comments? Anybody violently disagree with any of those opinions, <laughs> approaches? Okay, then the last two tips I have, one, as I said before, end early. This is exhausting. Um, it's good for people, it's good for everybody, but a little bit goes a long way. So it's better to have, like I said, three 30 minute sessions set up over several weeks than one 90 minute marathon where you all just are like, well, I don't ever do that again. Um, and actually it also helps because as they're talking, it will help them remember stuff. And then they will probably come back to you and go, oh, I thought of a story you know, that I forgot to tell you. So it actually, it takes a while as it starts working through their brain, they'll start thinking of more stories. One thing leads to another and they'll actually have more to tell you than if you tried to do it all in one session. And then um, the last one is just to thank them. And if it's a family member, you know, you might just do it, you know, verbally or um, over the phone or in an email. If it's um, a stranger, you might wanna be a little bit more formal. But the best way to thank somebody is not just to go, well, thanks, that was great, but to really pull out something that they said to you and say, you know, um, it's been a few days and I, I'm, still, I'm still chuckling over the story you told me of such and such, or I'm just, I know I'll never forget this story, or I've, I've told three people the story of such and such. If it's something specific, it just makes them feel more valued and more like um, they'll, they'll want to do more, so. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with is, um, I've given you all this, you know, guidelines and everything. And I, and what I wouldn't want is for you to think, oh my gosh, this sounds hard and confusing and I'm just never going to do it right. So I just won't do it at all. That would be the worst thing. <laughs> no matter what you do, it's going to be wonderful because any little snippet, I mean, it just becomes more valuable over time, right? And the only regret I ever hear anybody say about oral history interviews is that they regret that they didn't do it in time. You know, the person is gone, the person's memory is gone, whatever reason, that's the only regret I ever hear. So I would say, take the risk, do it, 
Don't worry that it's not perfect. Um, and remember too, that it's a gift. When you're doing this for someone, it's a gift for you. It's a gift for them. We all want to be listened to and heard and appreciated. So, so do it. <laughs> all right. That's everything that I had. Um, does, do people have any um, questions, comments? Well, I don't know. I think the question I posed at the beginning was that <clears throat> we would watch this carefully and and I don't know, do you folks think we should invite Liz back to do any other presentations? Well, I should hurt, certainly hope so. Thank you, Liz. Hmm. Uh, a lot to think about there. Yeah, good, good. This and especially now that we have uh, this technology of being able to connect with people in distant places by um, uh, Facebooking or FaceTiming or whatever, the name for all that is to say, oh, you know, um, I have an aunt or an uncle or wherever, but if you can get them to connect with you uh, by internet and, and I have some questions and things like this, I hadn't really thought about that before, but that's a very good point to make, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is, and people just feel really good when somebody reaches out and says, hey, I wanna know this about you. Um, yeah. This also works if you're trying to do your own um, sto life stories. All of those tools, the, the, the charts, the, the drawings, uh, the maps, the walking to places, all that stirs up your own memories. Um, and you can also, if, if it seems daunting to write everything down, you can also um, talk it. You know, yeah. there's recording yeah. devices, you can do it on the Zoom. So, you know, doing it yourself, um, you know, all that stuff works for, your, for yourself. And um, even back, I don't know, 20 some years ago, my grandmother did that. She did a, an audio cassette um, for the family, remem rem remembering her stories. She had a sister. They, they lived in a, a, a small town in Indiana where they, um, it was a Swiss town. So they spoke a certain dialect of um, Swiss German that's only spoken in a very small, I don't, I think it's gone now. And one of her sisters, did it, but on one side of the cassette, she did it in English, and on the other side, she did it in their, their own language, which is great from a ling even from a linguist perspective because it preserved that language. So um, that stuff is really valuable. I wanted to show you guys a few things too, because um, you can take these oral histories, you can, you can print them, you know, you can take stories out of it, right? You can do things with it um, electronically, but also just writing stuff down. So it can be as low, low, um, tech as this. This is it's a binder, a notebook that my mom did of like the story of their wedding and how my parents met and stuff. There's nothing fancy about it, but it's, you know, obviously it's wonderful and it grows more wonderful with time. Um, you can do, wait a minute, there's like book group, my family is so strange. So there's like little book things where you can self-publish. So this is a book six that, um, my parents, um, when, when one of my kids was six, his school, his teacher gave an assignment, ask your grandparents what they were like at six. So they both wrote these essays. And then um, a couple years ago, they found the essays, they put them into this book. There's a picture of my dad when he was six. Um, so they saved that for the grandchildren, the great grandchildren. So that's something you can do. I think blurb, they probably did it with blurb. And then this is a project that my mom and my brother did, if you can see, called Kate's Memories. And what he did basically was they had all these photographs, see? And then my mom would just um, describe what memories the photographs meant. So there's really not a lot of rhyme or reason to this book. Um, I think they kind of tried to put it sequential, but each picture is just like what she thought of stream of consciousness with each, um, each picture. So those are some things you can do that are pretty, that are fairly easy. Um, I think he did, I think they did that. They were actually, he was in California, she was in Ohio, my family scattered all over. Um, he put the pictures up on like a blog and she could just type in what she remembered. So she would just spend a little bit of time, you know, whenever she wanted typing it all in and then he put it all together in a book. So there's lots of different ways to, to, to do stuff like that. Um, do, do you have a, a question? Do I see a handout? 
I do have a question. It's Julia. Um, I'm just wondering, you made such wonderful points and I should have been taking notes, but I didn't. And I'm wondering, do you, um, could you like take a screenshot or something of the bullet points that you made? Because I, I definitely want to use that list. Or is, is that something that maybe if, you, if you're, this is being recorded, will we get a link to the Zoom and I can watch again and take notes this time? I think, it, yes, we are recording it. We can do that. We also have a... Um pamphlet document that we give to people when they're going to be doing oral history for us so we can I, if those if these tips aren't in that already I can add that there and it can be downloaded okay so. thank you so much mm -hmm. you did a great job it's fabulous <laughs> okay has anybody done oral history with their family already anybody Diana yeah who did you do it with I actually did it with my mom um oh. I never knew my dad so we sat down and we did an audio recording um, and it's precious. It's really, it's, I'm, I'm an interviewer um, having come out of executive search. So much of what you shared, um, it's kind of, you know, I just kind of adapted it to a more personal setting, um, but it was lovely. And, and it's, it's a very special recording now for us all. And we've shared it with other members of the family. That's wonderful. Do you have any um, tips that you could give as far as interviewing or anything that I said you don't agree with? That's fine. Oh, no. Um, I agreed with, with all of your points. Um, uh, but a lot of it has to do with, for, for me, um, how to become a better interviewer. And I really appreciated the points that you gave about, you know, it, don't acknowledge verbally, um, you know, maybe with your facial expressions to encourage them. Um, but a lot of the questions, it's, it's the prep ahead of time, you know, really diving into what you want to know um, and just documenting it and being able to share it with other family members um, before it's lost. It's, it's such an important thing to do. Does anybody have any plans to do any oral history after hearing this? Is any, like you thinking, oh, I really should talk to so-and-so or? Yeah, no? yes. And when you <laughs> said something about, um, just uh, telling your own story. Um, I'm getting pretty used to talking to myself quite a bit now. <laughs> so maybe uh, this time in our societal life when we don't gather as much to talk to other people, we can just talk to ourselves and record it. And, um, and then if we need to edit it, nobody else has heard it yet. So. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about even about my husband, Jerry, a lot of people don't even know I have a husband, but I do, um, and, and uh, he's the same one I've had for 57 years now, um, but not, not necessarily my first husband. Um, so um, Jerry has lots of tales because he, um, he was a farm boy, grew up on farm, very different from me being a city girl, and uh, also his very um, colorful um, career in the um, Federal Bureau of Prisons oh. and his stories about um, his his uh, career there. Uh, as I say, my children and I followed my husband around for 20 years he went while he was in prison. Um, but um, he did get out every day and he did get paychecks. So that was good. <laughs> but, you know, it does uh, what you've been talking about today, Liz, does bring to mind that a lot of us, especially as we get into our uh, over 50 life, um, that there are a lot of things that our kids may not know about us. And even um, thinking about uh, all the places that we lived all over the United States during Jerry's career um, of uh, having pictures or at least a map or something about that to, um, to document here's where we were when you were 10 years old and where you started school and that sort of thing. Um, most of the places they can remember, but their children and their children, and I already have great grandchildren, would not know all these things if they hadn't heard about them or been there. So yeah, very thought provoking. I appreciate this, um, this uh, kind of provoking to do, to do some of this in our own family and it does go more precious over time because if you think about it, if you had some scrap of information from your grandparents or great-grandparents how do. precious yeah. that is even you know even if it isn't perfect and so yes. you know it's it's just right. so 
so precious. So I have um, I have a few letters that my grandparents wrote to each other back um, uh, in the thirties and then uh, in the forties. And I I remember in these letters, my grandmother. My, my grandfather was working away out of town, but you know, back in those days, you could send a letter and the next day or so the person would have it. And then there was two, usually uh, in Greensboro where I grew up, there were two mail deliveries today. There was a morning mail and the afternoon mail and things got around pretty fast. Uh, but she was asking him about being able to spend $12 on a new winter coat that she really needed and that it was on sale but she didn't want to buy it unless it was okay with him. And did he think that they could afford this $12 coat? Things like that, that give you a uh, insight into what they were thinking and doing and what was important, um, which she probably never would have thought to say to me on uh, a recording, but just having that little note, that letter that's, somehow survived all of the scraps of paper. Uh, and I should, I should do something with those for my children and grandchildren's sakes, yeah. Yeah, it, it's so precious. It's amazing how those little bits of minutiae can be so poignant. Yes, you know? yeah. And, and where they would think, oh, that's not important, but it is, it just tells yeah, you so yeah. much, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. I hope she got her coat. <laughs> I think she did. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody else? Anything? No. Okay. So we're gonna have uh, in October. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. Well, first in September, we've got um, September twenty third, a week from Thursday. We're gonna be getting together in person. Yay! Big, big risk. <laughs> we're gonna be outside. We're gonna be on the Garrison lawn. The um, shanty crew is going to sing shanty songs um, from Bob. You can the you are one of the shanty crew. You're going to be on the porch of the garrison, right? Right, on the porch. And we have uh, some Tim Turman will <coughs> talk to us about the kind of the, his, the history of, of sea, sea shanties and uh, in, including the Menhaden fishermen in, in Southport and. One of the shanties that we're going to sing is kind of is a, a tribute to that to the Menhaden fishermen, and it was a, a shanty that, that they sang. They sang. Uh, bye bye, Rosiana is the name. But we'll do about five, five or six, six others, other shanties. And, uh, I think Liz may we may to talk about that. We may want to start the meeting at 5:30. I saw uh, you. So we have plenty of time, daylight time, so people aren't walking or walking to their cars or home in the in the darkness. Yeah. So 5:30, I'll send out a correction, to everybody. 5:30 a week from Thursday, the 23rd. And is Donnie going to be speaking as well? Yes, Donnie will be speaking about the Menhaden fishing. Donnie Joyner. So we're encouraging people to bring their lawn chairs or blankets and kind of spread out on the garrison lawn. So we have social distance, we'll be in the fresh air and we'll cross our fingers and it'll all be good. We'll be able to actually be in person. Um, and then in October, um, well, on October 16th, the um, JNS Cemetery is gonna be having a, a celebration. They're sort of starting an open air museum at their cemetery. They've added some signs, they're encouraging people to come. Again, it's outdoors, that's on Saturday the 16th. On Saturday the 23rd um, is the Living Voices of the Past. And so we will be having, I think about 10 maybe, um, characters come to life, historical people. Um, Pat, Kate Stewart, right? And yep. Bob, um, Bob yes. will be Mary Aspel. <laughs> And I will be representing Jesse Stevens Taylor. And we have someone new coming um, who is, she's going to be representing her great grandmother. So we actually have someone who's talking about their family. Um, her great grandmother's name was Katie Teresa Piver Farmer Cox. And um, her husband, her first husband passed away during the last flu pandemic. She lost her husband in the first wave and her baby in the second wave. 
uh, and then went on to get married and have the, the children who the, now the descendants are coming. So um, it's an interesting connection to, to now. And so that's gonna be an actual family member that'll be there. And then on the 30th of October, we will be having a, um, we just today, we cleaned the, um, the tower, the pilot's tower. Um, we, the, um, we had it professionally cleaned by a, a cleaning service from, Hatter, uh, from Hatteras. And then um, we will be having a, a, a celebration of the tower and we will be commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Wilmington Cape Fear Pilots Association. Uh, we will have one of our members, Debbie um, Malachek, sorry, too blank there, Debbie Malachek, found the original article in the Wilmington newspaper for when they dedicated the, um, the tower the, it, originally. And what they did, it was all written up and what they did and everything. And she found which, um, uh, what songs they sang. And so um, we're, we're gonna have the same song. I just drew a blank on another name again. We are gonna have the same song sung this time. Bob, who am I thinking of is singing? Uh, Cindy Sellers. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was still, all I could think of was Susie Carson. I knew that wasn't it. <laughs> Cindy Sellers is going to be singing Peace Be Still, which is what they sang at the same at last time. So that gives me goosebumps. And um, one of the great grandsons of one of the men who perished uh, that the tower commemorates is going to be um, giving the prayer. So it's just going to be a very nice, and Mary Ellen will be the, um, the, the MC. So it's going to be a really nice event. I hope you guys can come. The, uh, the October Tuesday, Tuesday talk Oh, um, will will be uh, Mike Mike Royal, the Southport story storyteller. But joining Mike are going to be Catherine Catherine Huffam, uh, Libby Walton Merritt, um, and other cast members for the high school play Pygmalion. And they will they will have a good time, and we will have a good time as they tell us their stories of, about the play and, and putting it putting it together. Um, they. Also invited, I, I, I can't remember the woman's name, but the, wo the woman who was a young teacher back then, who was the director uh, or the, the faculty member supporting the, the play. So it promises to be a fun, a fun evening. All right, I think that'll be good. And of course, don't forget Paddle Through History. If you want to go kayaking with Bob and learn a little history, there's a trip tomorrow, there's a trip in November, October, and there's a trip in November. I don't remember the exact dates, but you can call Adventure Kayak Company and find out, and it'll, it's wonderful. All right, anything else? Thank you very much, everybody. Bob, did you have anything? You can come back, Liz. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.